Kia ora tato. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Let's try that again. Hi, everyone. Hello. Great. I like to do that. Um, kia ora. Hey, before we launch in, I just want to um, mihi to a couple of people, which is just say a couple of thank yous. Um, first thank you goes to Catherine, who was the main driver of making all of this happen. Um, the... Uh, the rest of us on the staff team helped a bit. Um, the other person I want to give mad props to is Jared, um, who uh, isn't actually on the staff team anymore, but, um, but basically functions like one, um, who is here on Sunday afternoon, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Saturday, like so often just to, just to make all this happen. And so here we are in a space, and so far the main things work, and what we've found out is children love running. So... Um, so welcome, welcome. Uh, let me start uh, by saying this. Kia whakarongoa ki au ki te tangi a te manu nei a te mātui. Tui, 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 tui a. Tui a e runga, tui a e raro, tui a e waho, tui a e roto, tui a e te here tangata. Ka rongo te pō, ka rongo te ao. Tui a e te muka tangata e taki mai, ho waiki nui, ho waiki roa, ho waiki pāma Māori, hono e te wairua, ki te whai ao, ki te ao marama, tihei, Māori ora. And so... Listen, listen, because everything is being weaved together from the top to the bottom, from the inside to the outside, listen. Pay attention to the light, pay attention to the dark, because there's something that is being woven together that has been with us for a very, very long time, and as we follow that, we will find light, and we will find life. Amen, amen. That is... um. What we're pretty much doing today, so welcome to the exile, both in the physical space and, um, and in the metaphorical sense as well, that is, that is all of us, here we are. Um, normally when I do sermons, this is kind of how it works, I kind of like tell a story and then there's a piece of scripture and then I unpack the scripture a bit and then I kind of land some things, and this weird thing happened this week where I was trying to like work out what stories of my own that I was going to draw on to be able to kind of land the scripture. And I just couldn't think of any at all. And what, what God revealed to me over the week is that there is a story that we can tell, but it's not my story, it's our story. And so basically what I'm going to do today is try and tell the story of scripture through the lens of exile. That's my hope. Um, and my hope is that as we tell the big story, we would once again um, be incredibly grateful for God's grace, for inviting us into the family, for sending his son, for filling us with his spirit, for inviting us to be part of what he's doing in the world, for the gift that it is to know God um, as, we, as we engage with this big, big, long story and our place within it. So no my heart of my, um, here we go. One way of telling the story about exile is by telling a story about us and our proximity to God. Yes, there's, there's this, there are moments in the biblical story where God and humans live in really close proximity to each other. They share a space, and then there are other moments in the biblical story where humans wander far away from God. Exile, in its essence, is when you are far from God. And maybe you've experienced that um, super unsettling feeling. It's actually a hard feeling to name. For most of us, we have had moments of experiencing it. It's that, it's that feeling that something's missing, that things aren't how they're meant to be, that there's something wrong. And it's, it's a strange feeling because you can have you know, friends and you can have family and you can have a house and you can have a job and you can really enjoy drinking chamomile tea. You know, you can, have, you can have everything, and yet you can still feel like something really significant is missing, like something is incomplete. Sometimes you can even feel like a stranger, um, or you're like alone in your own existence. Does anyone relate to this, this, this feeling, this experience? It's actually a really important thing to hone in on. I think a lot of people can identify with that. And when we have those moments where we have those experiences, it actually leads us to some pretty big questions like, what is it that we are missing? Or why do I feel like something is missing? Or how am I even meant to live in this world? Well, exile and return is one way that the Bible talks about this 
just feeling, just sense. I, have a, um, I used to have a job where I got to speak in all sorts of different schools. And uh, it was really interesting. It was kind of easy to speak in some schools because the kids didn't have a whole lot of hope to start with. And so you could actually stand there and by just sharing a bit of your story, you would offer some sort of hope. I found it way harder talking in really, really wealthy schools where all the kids had had everything that they could ever dream of just provided for them. You know, the type of schools where people get bought, you know, a Volkswagen Golf for their 16th birthday, you know, that, that type of thing. And what I realized after a while is that sense that I just named, that was the sense that existed in those schools. What does it mean to have everything and yet still feel empty? And the Bible talks about that in some pretty profound ways. So the Bible starts in Eden, and it tells a story about humanity having a home where things are good, where relationships are right, where there is connection with the divine and, you know, with God, where you're not trying to figure out what's good and bad on your own. You are actually doing that in relationship with this power that is greater than you and wiser than you, and there, there is abundance and there is peace. I think that's actually what we're craving. And so that's what the Garden of Eden was, and then that was lost. And so the first story of the Bible is about a dream that humanity was exiled from. We were exiled from what is truly good, and now we're just kind of aching for it. That sense that something's not right, to me, is that ache for Eden. It's the ache for closeness. It's the ache for being seen and known. (sighs) What I want to do today is try and trace that ache, that ache that we all have, through the theme of the exile, through the Bible, and then begin to think about how we live here and now in anticipation of Jesus returning and recreating the world to make it what it was always meant to be. A new Eden is the picture that we get at the end of the Bible. Like the Bible tells us the story of humanity's exile from the garden and then God's relentless plan to deal with human sin so that he can recreate a new Eden which we can all be a part of. It's actually good news. Yes? Like, it's really good news. The big picture of the Bible is about Eden, exile, and then return to Eden. And so here is a key idea. In the Garden of Eden, God and humans shared the same space. God walked through the garden. God was there. The humans were there. There was connection and relationship, and that's how God dreamed it would be. I actually think that's, that's the thing we're aching for, to be seen and known, to be loved and to be connected to God in a way where there is nothing to fear and nothing to doubt because all of us are fully available to God and he is fully available to us. And we, because of Jesus, we get to experience that in pockets, in these moments, and they're beautiful and they're profound, but there's still that ache for things to be how they were meant to be. So that was Eden. The rest of the story is of exile and return. And we all know the start of that story, right? Because humans decide that they would rebel. And instead of trusting God, they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their eyes are open. And their relationships instantly begin to break down. Yeah? The man and the woman hide themselves from each other. Then they hide themselves from God. And the sad thing is they convince themselves that that's the best thing to do with this new knowledge that they've acquired is to, is to clothe themselves and hide themselves and put distance between them and other people. That's what happens when humans decide what is good and evil on their own terms. We get it wrong and it causes pain and brokenness and relationship breakdown and it's horrible and we have all experienced it, either by what has happened to us or what we have done to other people or some mix of both. Yeah? And so God, he says, you know, at least they eat from the tree of life and become like one of us. And so he banishes them from the garden. They were in Eden, a place of abundance and connection to God, filled with God's presence, and they were were exiled from it. Eden is like the first promised land, and because of the people's choices, they get kicked out of it. Does that sound familiar? The start of the story is the story that then Israel plays out in far more detail over far more generations, but it's the same story. So from Genesis like three to 11, we get story after story about human violence and human oppression ruining God's good world. And when humans are disconnected from God and when humans are deciding what is good and bad all by themselves, that's what happens. We start to represent hell on earth more than heaven on earth. We 
ruin God's good world. I mean, in, in Genesis 11, we get this story about all the humans coming together to build Babel. And Babel is, it's, it's one of the strange things about the Bible. Babel is Babylon, which is the place that people get excited back to later in the story. And the reason that they're doing it is to make a name for themselves so that they are not scattered over the face of the earth. And they use the latest technology, which was bricks, yeah, to build a tower to the heavens. It's almost like they're trying to become like gods. They are trying to reconnect with God, but they're doing it in a very human way. They're doing it out of relationship with God. They're going, we're going to do this for ourselves. And so God scatters them. And it's from this scattering, from this exile, that God calls Abraham to the land of Canaan, to the promised land. And it's there that God will bless him and his descendants and make him great. Just think about the contrast there. In Babel, you've got these humans using their power and their skills to do something to make themselves like God, to make a name for themselves. And then out of the scattering, God calls one man. He goes, I'm going to make your name great. I am going to bless you. I'm going to bring you abundance. Trust me. Go to the land that I've told you to go to. And so Abraham amazingly does and then as soon as he gets to the promised land, I don't know how familiar with, you are with this story, there's a famine, so he's there for a tiny bit, and then he leaves because he doesn't trust God. Abraham's story is really interesting. He's a man of faith that doesn't. He does, and then he doesn't, and he does, and then he doesn't. He's a picture of what we're like. Yeah? yeah? yeah. And so Abraham trusts God. He goes to the promised land. Then he leaves, and basically he exiles himself to Egypt where a few generations later, all of his descendants end up. They are somewhere they are not meant to be. And then eventually, Abraham's descendants end up being oppressed, and so God partners with Moses and dramatically rescues his people. He sets them free, and they begin finally, after hundreds and hundreds of years, to head towards the promised land. Now, we as a community spend about a year working through the Exodus story, so hopefully that's kind of familiar to you. But most of the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are set in, and tell the story of um, the people of Israel leaving Egypt, wandering in the wilderness in preparation to get to the promised land. But it's not just a story about returning to the place that they were always meant to be. It also tells the story of God dwelling in the midst of his people again, right? Part of the point of the covenant and the law and everything that happens is so that God can live with his people again. There's the covenant at Mount Sinai. There's like the presence of God on the mountain. And then these people make a promise that they're going to be the type of people in the world that God can dwell amongst. Some stuff goes really wrong. Moses like negotiates on behalf of the people and then God goes, yeah, I'll be your God. He hands them the plans for the tabernacle, which is legitimately one of the most boring pieces of scripture um, because you've got to read it twice. <laughs> that's, the, that's the consequence of sin right there. Um, so you read the whole thing twice, and then they eventually build it. And the tabernacle is, oh man, hang on, let me just find myself. They eventually build the tabernacle, and it's kind of like a portable Eden. It's this tent that is this, at the center of the camp, and when it's finished, it's filled with God's presence in this amazing way. So once again, like these people aren't home, but God is in the midst of them once again. It's like kind of half of what it was meant to be. But there are a couple of issues. Only one person can actually enter that sacred tabernacle space. So it's not like the Eden where humanity dwelt with God. It's like one representative of humanity gets to dwell with God. And the other problem is that they're not in the promised land. And so there's this big, big question hanging over the people of Israel at this stage. And the question is this, is will the people be the type of people that God has called them to be? It's the same question for us. The question that hangs in the air is, will they represent him well to the nations? Will they be faithful to the covenant? Will they follow God's laws? Will they be the type of people that God can dwell amongst? And that question just lingers. It just sits there. So eventually they make it into the promised land. God parts the Jordan River and they enter. And you get Joshua and the judges who have moments of trusting God. And when they do, things go really, really well for them. And then they have moments where they don't and things don't. Now, after Joshua and the judges, the people decide that they want a king to be like all the other nations, and so God gives them, he gives the people what they want. First, they get Saul, he's not too great, then they get David, and David is incredible. David is amazing. Most of the time, he actually trusts God. I say most of the time, because he didn't always. 
you know, there's that one like Bathsheba incident. And then it's really, it's really interesting as well. At the end of David's life, it's really sad. He's on his deathbed handing out, handing out like basically penalties to the people that have wronged him throughout his life. It's a really sad end. It's a picture of like how not to do the end of life. Anyway, David is, David is amazing. Most of the time he trusts God and he trusts God's wisdom. And because of his faithfulness, the nation of Israel is blessed and there is abundance and there is peace. And every man sits under his own vine and fig tree and it's beautiful. And so God makes this promise to David that one of David's descendants will rule forever and he gives David the plans to make a permanent house for God. God is going to permanently dwell with his people again. Woo! This is, like a, this is like a step towards the bringing back together of the dream that was in Eden. God is going to permanently dwell amongst his people in the temple. Um, but because of the ways that David gets it wrong, the task of building that temple gets passed to Solomon. But it's coming together, man. There's this human who trusts God and trusts his wisdom and the nation is being, is being blessed and is a blessing to the surrounding nations. And so Solomon builds the temple. Here's what it says in, seven, in Chronicles 7, verses 1 to 3. Yes. When Solomon, so this is the, like, this is the day when the temple was finished, and Solomon stands up, and there's this, this is what happens. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. There's this coming home. There's this bringing back together. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord filling it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and they gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good, his love endures forever. There's something about having close proximity to the divine that reorients our hearts and helps us to see what is truly good in the world. And it creates this posture of love and gratitude, um, which does something significant to us that helps us to be the people we were made to be. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So it's looking good. God's dwelling with the people again. Yes. And there's this wise human who trusts God and he's leading the people of Israel to be who they were created to be. And he's writing love poetry, which you should definitely read. Um, and he writes the Proverbs and it's amazing, but humans are human. And so Solomon does what humans tend to do. He basically does everything that the Bible says that you shouldn't do if you are the king of Israel. Literally, there's a whole passage in, Deuteron in Deuteronomy that says, if you're the king, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then there's this passage in Chronicles which says, and Solomon did this, and Solomon did this, and Solomon did this, and they're all the things you're not meant to do. And so, um, within a generation, oh, within a couple of generations, there's civil war, the people of Israel um, fight, and they just forget about their God. And God raises up prophet after prophet to warn the people that if they fail to represent him well and live as he's taught them to live, they're gonna get kicked out of the land. They're going to be exiled. They're gonna find themselves back wandering in the desert. They're gonna find themselves again far from God. But they don't listen. And then these foreign nations destroy the kingdoms and the temple itself is destroyed. God's permanent home is destroyed in 587, 586 BC by the Babylonian Empire. Uh, and the people are dragged away to a foreign land. I don't think, I think it's really hard for us to engage with what the lived experience of that would be like. With the lived experience of a, an army invading, destroying the most important thing to our entire people group, and then picking us up and then deporting us to Invercargill. Actually, I can't imagine that. That would be horrible. Um, that was just a stab at Invercargill. I feel bad about that already. <clears throat> See, humans are human. Okay. This is literally one of the most significant something is not right moments in the entire Bible. You get these blessed people who are chosen to be a kingdom of priests. You know, they are the covenantal people of God, and yet they are the ones who have had the temple destroyed and have been taken and placed somewhere else. But... At this point, we're actually doing really well, guys. Whew. But at this point, the prophets begin to dream. They, can, they taste the brokenness, they feel that ache, and they begin to dream again. They begin to dream about a faithful human, a new Adam, 
who will be faithful to God and trust his wisdom. They begin wisdom. They begin to dream of a new leader like Moses who can lead the people back to the promised land. They start to dream of a new king, a king like David who can create, who can recreate a time in Israel's history where there is blessing and abundance and peace. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Malachi, these are the prophets that tell these stories. And as they dream, they wait. And eventually they return from their physical exile in Babylon. This is just the nation of Judah. They return to the land. And they rebuild the temple, but it's not as good, and God doesn't come and fill it again. And so they're back in the land, but something isn't right. They don't have a king. They're ruled by foreign empires. Most of the people don't trust God. They're where they're meant to be geographically, but they're not where they're meant to be spiritually. They're not where they're meant to be theologically. They are not in, the, in close proximity to the presence of God. Something's broken. And so all of these different people, if you've ever read like second temple literature, which is a fun thing to do on a Sunday afternoon, all of these different Jewish people dream about what's going to need to happen. And they start to read through the scriptures and imagine what this Messiah is going to be and what he's going to do. And there are all sorts of ideas about what is going to happen. And that brings us right up to the New Testament. Everyone's still tracking with me? Cool. Okay. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Okay. So the New Testament starts with John the Baptist. Not all of the stories, but he's there really early on in the piece. Now, he is this prophet who's hanging out at the Jordan River at the exact spot where Joshua and the nation of Israel came into the land. He's gone right back to the start of their story, and he's washing them in the river. He's asking them to basically like be baptized, which is to like basically die to what was and to rise again to a new thing. And he's inviting them to prepare themselves to be ready for the new thing that is going to happen. And then they walk back into Jerusalem, back to the promised land, as these people who are committed to being a different type of people in the world in anticipation of what Jesus is going to do. Cool, eh? Like these people have prepared themselves for the new thing that God is going to do. But the question lingers in the air. How will God dwell amongst his people? How will God deal with human brokenness? How will God end the exile? They're back, but how is he gonna put things right? And I love what John says about Jesus. This is in John 1.14. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. I'm going to say that again. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. How's God going to put this right? He himself is going to become man and dwell among mankind. How is God going to fix this exile where humans are far from God? How is God going to put the, the dream back together like in the Eden where humans and God were in the same space, God becomes a human and dwells among the people. Isn't that incredible? Seriously, this is where, this is where it starts getting crazy because this is where the Christian claim about who Jesus is sounds really strange if you're not someone who's had an experience of Jesus and God and put your faith in him. But God's plan was to become a human. Jesus was both man and God. This is what Christians believe. And by being both God and man, he demonstrated how humans were truly created to live. He walked as a man, he walked with God, and he was God. Those three things are all true. The Gospels, which tell four stories about Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension, are to me the most compelling thing ever written. They are the story of God's commitment to dwell among his people and the sacrifice that he is prepared to endure to make it possible. This is good news. This is is the solution to this cosmic ache that we feel. God is so committed to restoring humans back to who they were created to be, to live in a way that he dreamed they were made to live, that he is willing to sacrifice himself so he can dwell amongst his people again. This is the, there is, the, there is this like profound story which Jesus tells, which actually gets to the like heart of the theme of exile. There's this son who demands of this father all the stuff that he doesn't deserve, and the father in his goodness gives it to him. And then this son goes away and squanders all of his possessions and finds himself in this horrific situation. And then this is what it says, the book of Luke. 
the son returns and he's going, just let, just, I'll come back just, and honestly, if you just feed me, I'll work on the farm like it's sweet. I'm not expecting anything here. This is the father. He says, but while the son was still far off, off his father saw him and filled him with, and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his finger and the sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and he's now alive. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. In this story, Jesus is in the father slot doing whatever he can which is him sacrificing himself to make it possible for us to return. This is such good news. So how does God solve the problem of humans being far from God? God becomes a human. He then absorbs within himself all of the consequences of human brokenness, which has caused disconnection between God and mankind. And then through Jesus, God starts to recreate the world to make it how God always dreamed it could be. One of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible is John chapter 20. Um, I don't know if you've got a favorite chapter. It's mine, partially because of the running race. Um, But the other reason is this tiny little line. In John 20 verse 15, it says this. So Jesus has risen again and Mary is at the tomb, like devastated going, where is he? Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Jesus, woman, woman. Anyway, I think he said it nicely. Woman. I think you get in trouble if you say woman. Anyway, woman, dishes. Um, That's how I'm imagining it being said, and I don't think it's that. Anyway, can you say that nicely? I've really, that's one of those moments where I went down the wrong path. Anyway, Jesus says, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Seeking, And this is what the Bible says. Thinking that he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I'll take him. Of course Mary mistakes Jesus for the gardener. Because he is. Because of his resurrection, he is the beginning of new Eden. He is the beginning of new creation. He is the one who's making it possible He is the one who is starting to till the soil of new Eden, and then he invites us to be a part of it. Of course he's the gardener. Yes? He is the one making a way for us to live in close proximity to God once again. That is what new creation is, is. And after his death and resurrection and ascension, he then returns to the Father so that God's personal presence can be sent to everyone who puts their trust in Jesus. This is when the story catches up to us. Because at Pentecost, the Spirit lands on all of those who put their faith in Jesus, and the world is changed forever, and here is why. Because if we are open to God's presence here and now, if we trust God, then we are actually able to experience the Holy Spirit now. And when we are filled with the Spirit, we are in some mystical way, we are able to enter into new creation now. We become like portable Edens, where we are both human and we have God's name and spirit residing inside of us. We are like temples. We are like people where there is an overlap of God's space and our space, and it permeates out from us into the world around us. We create pockets of new Eden. We create pockets of new creation. When we align ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to God, and we trust in Him, we can become vessels. We can become ambassadors. We can become priests. We can become temples. We can become gardens that nurture what humans were always meant to be. This is the story. Those are all metaphors and themes that the New Testament writers draw on to describe what happens to us because of what the Holy Spirit has done in and through us because of what Jesus has done to make it possible for God to dwell amongst his people once again in anticipation of when Jesus will return and the whole thing will be put back together. 
where everything will be made right, where God will return and our spaces will overlap in such a way that there'll be no more weeping, that there'll be no more, you know, those beautiful pictures of Revelation 21 and 22. You guys all with me? This is such incredible news that we were far from God, yet while we were still far off, Christ died for us. That sounds famous. This is Paul, this is Romans, this is the story. Jesus, no, God is so committed to dwelling amongst his people that he sacrificed himself so that he could dwell amongst us again, so that we could step back into the dream that he always had for us. This is good news. But things are still not entirely how they should be. This is what it means to live in this age awaiting the age to come. Because we all have moments where we are not in step with the Spirit. We all have moments where instead of representing heaven on earth as we are called to, we define good and evil on our own terms and we recreate hell on earth. We all have moments where we have that moment of decision in front of us between going this way and going this way. And like Paul says, I know the things I want to do and I don't do them. I know the things I don't want to do and I do them over and over again. And so we return to the cross and to the grace and to the love and we repair and we forgive and we apologize and we lament and we laugh and we love, right? This is the, this is the cycle that we're... But things aren't entirely right. When the world is fully put back together, when Christ returns, that option will be no longer right? Because we'll be, so, we'll be so permeated by God's presence that we will be what we were always created to be. That's problem number one. Yes? Problem number two is this. We are still waiting. We're still waiting for the, the cosmic return where everything will be put to right. And what that means is while we're waiting, we have moments and pockets where we experience Eden, where God is close, where there's an overlap of heaven and earth. For a lot of people, church is this. This is a space that's carved out where we like realign ourselves and, and connect with God and then move back out into our week. But it's not the only space that this happens because like I said, we are temples, priests, we are new gardens, we are new creation. And so in relationship with God and the Holy Spirit, this can happen in every space. But we have these pockets where things are for a short period of time as they should be. And part of being a disciple of Jesus is learning to live in that space more and more and more. But... There are still broken humans running this place as it is. I'm not talking about this church in particular. <laughs> Although that's true. I'm talking about this city, and I'm talking about this country, and I'm talking about the world. There are still broken humans running this place, and sometimes they, they tap into systems, they align themselves to the, to the justice that we are meant to pursue, and actually good things happen, but then more often than not what happens is they go, guys, we found the solution, and then they roll it out, and it makes everything worse, right? There are, these, there are all these different systems that kind of govern how things happen at the moment, and some of them are good and some of them bad, but they're, they're run by broken humans, and so we are trying to work out in the present moment, because of God's recreating Holy Spirit in us, how to both be faithful to God and good citizens of this time and this place while we await the full redemption of all things. And that is why we're in exile as a theme, because working out how to do that is actually one of the most challenging things about following Jesus. Working out how to be both faithful and good citizens in this time and this place, which things we are loyal to and which things we subvert, which practices we're a part of and which things we are not. That challenge what things we, uh, we actively pursue in anticipation of things um, being put back together and which things we step back from, this is the challenge. And so, man, I'm gonna finish on time. This is great. Last thought. The book of Galatians is one of my, um, is one of my favorite books. I've got a favorite chapter today, John chapter 20. Go home and read it, it's great. Uh, Galatians is one of my favorite books because at first it's just Paul like yelling at people because they want other people to get circumcised. Um, and it's just so interesting. I love scripture like that where you're like, what is going on here? And to break it down really simply, this is what's going on. Paul is saying to a group of people, you do not become a follower of Jesus 
by what, um, by what one, someone can do to you with their own hands, right? A physical mark on your body is not what makes you a follower of Jesus. And he spends like, he spends like four chapters doing that. Hey, bro, come here. He says, what makes you a follower of Jesus is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He goes, the actual mark of if you're a follower of Jesus, of if, of if you are actually like aligned to this, the actual mark are the fruits of the Spirit. It's that, if there's anything that's gonna prove evidence of your affiliation to Jesus, it's not that you're circumcised, it's that your life starts to look like this. There's peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, joy, self-control, and some others, because I didn't, faith. Yes, that's really important. And then he says this, And then he says this in in Genesis 5, 25. So if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It is the Spirit that has brought us to life again. It's the Spirit that opens the doorway for us to be new creation, new Eden. So let's keep in step with the Spirit. Picture an army walking. That's my son, I like him. Picture an army, right? And the way that they march in time. So we have the Holy Spirit who's got a pace, we have Jesus who has a pace, and we can keep ourselves aligned to the pace. We can stay in step, we can stay in tune for another metaphor here, that's a musical one. We can stay in the same rhythm with the Holy Spirit, and Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit if we live by the Spirit. And so that's where we find ourselves. We find ourselves with access to God right here, right now, who's recreating us and inviting us to be part of new creation. And yet we find the challenge of having to consistently realign ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to be filled by the Holy Spirit so we're empowered to be who we're meant to be as we deal with all of the challenges of what it looks like to live in this age where things are broken in anticipation of what is coming. And so I think there are, I think there are probably a few things for us to think about, to reflect on um, out of all of this. One thing to me is just with absolute gratitude to thank God for his grace and what he did through Jesus on the cross and inviting us home that we can in this moment know him, that he can know us, that we can be filled with his spirit. There is, it's really easy to take that for granted. I think another thing is we can invite Jesus once again to dwell within us. Sometimes by our, by our choices or by our apathy or by the things that we put our time and energy to, we take our eye off the fact that we have this divine calling. And we can invite Jesus to fill us once again. We can listen to his voice and we can learn to trust him. We can keep in step with the Spirit. We can ask ourselves that question that we ask around here all the time, God, what is it that you're saying to me and what do you want me to do about it? That's a really easy way to start the process of keeping in step with the Spirit. A really practical thing that we can do is take seriously working on our sin so that we can be a holy dwelling place. And I think the last thing that we can do is we can ask God the question, what is it? How is it that you want me to actively partner with you in bringing about new creation in anticipation of when you finally put things together? So from the promised land to exile to Eden 2.0, this is the story the Bible tells. We find ourselves in the middle of it with this profound invitation to be a different type of people in the world. The question is, will we be those people?